Good morning. That was weak. Let's do it again. Good morning. It's great to see uh, so many of you here for this inaugural lecture in our Medicine Research and Society Policy Issue Series. It's really hard to imagine a better place than here to have such a series examining the intersection of public policy issues and issues around scientific and medical research. I want to thank the Baker Institute for Public Policy for sponsoring this, and particularly the leadership of Neil Lane. We're also extraordinarily pleased to have as our partner in this venture the MD Anderson Cancer Center of the University of Texas. We couldn't ask, in fact, for a better partner in this endeavor. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome the extraordinary president of the MD Anderson <laughs> Cancer Center, Dr. John Mendelson. Well, good morning. First of all, let me say that we are thrilled to uh, be participating in this collaboration with the Baker Institute. And uh, this inaugural lecture is, is particularly exciting to me. <clears throat> Dr. Elias Zerhouni was born and educated in Algeria. He came to the United States and spent most of his career until recently at Johns Hopkins, where he was chairman of the Department of Radiology and then the executive vice dean and uh, helped that institution weather some very challenging times and then accepted the job of being the director of the National Institutes of Health, I think not knowing that that would be even more challenging times. And it's easy to do well when uh, the economy's great and budgets are rising, and it's, it's a <clears throat> testimony to his skills that he did very well at a time when there were many challenges. And very briefly, Dr. Zuhuni promoted collaboration in a place full of silos, Obesity became a national issue, and he got together a task force that brought together seven different NIH institutes, which was unprecedented. He promoted innovation. He, he created a new type of award called a Pioneer Award, where out-of-the-box thinking uh, was peer-reviewed and then funded. He changed the way we are teaching and carrying out clinical research, creating new uh, grants to support clinical research, and. Uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center joined with MD Anderson in capturing one of those grants by peer review. Uh, he taught the NIH how to prioritize, set up a roadmap process which allowed uh, prioritization of major initiatives uh, that required long-term funding, and he promoted education. He was concerned that too many grant dollars were going to the established outstanding scientists and we weren't feeding the pipeline properly and he created new grants for young investigators to get them out of the servitude of working for the major uh, scientists and giving them a chance to work on their own. So we're very fortunate to have uh, with us a very wise leader, an experienced leader, and I'm very much looking forward to what he tells us. First of all, I would like to thank um, John, the Baker Institute, Ed, for having me at Rice University. When John called me and said that he was supporting this lecture in partnership with the Baker Institute in terms of developing a better debate about policy, health, science, I thought that was a good thing. And I really said right away, immediately, I am in. And uh, this was a few months ago when I was still an NIH director, and I thought he had made a decent deal because when you're an NIH director and you're in the government, the first thing that happens to you is you, you lose your First Amendment rights. You can't speak frankly all the time. And he made an even better deal because I stepped down just before the election and now I'm free to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of perspective about NIH and its place in society and its impact on, on health and research. 
then tell you where the challenges are right now, where we are going in terms of science policy, in terms of the programs and the subject of science. And then I'll talk to you about two topics that are near and dear to me, that is young investigators and the funding and the sustaining of the scientific infrastructure and the reason why underneath all of this we do need to have a societal debate that is deeper than what we have today. So uh, without further ado, if I can get the slides to work. Um, what I would like to, to do is to just tell you very quickly a very short history of the NIH. Most people don't appreciate that the NIH has been the main engine for biomedical research in this country. And the mission is very simple. It's science in pursuit of fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living system and, Congress said, the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce the burdens of illness and disability. And if you look at the history, it, it, it's not a recent history. It's actually pretty ancient. And it's deeply connected to the scientific knowledge of the time. In 1887, uh, the government created a laboratory of hygiene because the germ theory of disease was predominant at the time. And then in 1930, the American Chemical Society, Chemical Society, it wasn't a disease society, promoted the idea of a National Institute of Health based, based on biochemistry. At the time, it was pretty clear that you could develop drugs that were synthetically made and that you could understand biology as a biochemical process. And then the National Cancer Institute was created, which made it the National Institutes of Health. And then President Roosevelt, with his science advisor, Vannevar Bush, made the real modern NIH and NSF possible by understanding that the federal government had a very fundamental role in promoting science and technology, and that led to the explosion of knowledge that we've seen in the past 60 years in the United States. And that, made, made, that became a law. But let me take you back to the 1930 Act. Senator Ransdell of Louisiana uh, said, look, we're spending an enormous amount of money uh, for health care. At the time, a billion dollars. That was the bill for health care estimated in 1930, of which drugs, including patent medicine, was half of the cost was drugs. And at the time, people felt that uh, we needed to understand better how this worked and we needed to develop new cures. And so they said, wouldn't that be better to spend a few million dollars to understand that? And that was the Rensdale Act, which created a modern NIH. And then the history is very very straightforward, a very brilliant history in terms of creating research laboratories, getting a new generation of scientists trained in the intramural program at the NIH, who then became leaders across all of the United States and serve public health, serve science. Many of the leaders of American medicine today and American biological research are trained and have had an interaction with the NIH. And many of them became Nobel laureates, to date 122 grantees and trainees of the NIH have received Nobel Prizes. Now, that takes me to, to today. What's the NIH? The NIH is an agency that funds the majority of biomedical research. It has a budget of about $29.5 billion. 84% of the budget is distributed to a very unique system. It's actually very unique in the world, whereby through grant, grant applications that are independently peer-reviewed um, without uh, earmarks, if you will, uh, we then distribute these grants to 3,000 institutions and 300,000 scientists are supported by, by these grants at multiple universities and, and research institutions. About 10 percent of the budget stays at the NIH in what we call the intramural program. That's the program that government scientists have to maintain for areas of priority, public health, the safety of the blood supply, the development of vaccines. These are the things that the government cannot not take responsibility for, and that's the intramural program. And about 5% is administration and, and, and um, management, oversight, and so on. But let me just say that if you, as, an, as a country, said, what did I get in return for this investment? Because there's a sense that perhaps research is actually a problem in healthcare. Every new technology increases costs. And uh, where's the value, therefore? And I, I wanted to testify in Congress about the value because we had doubled the budget of the NIH and many people were saying, was that a good thing? So I came up with basically information that shows value and in investment because 
there's a fundamental difference between an investment in, in science and technology, which is an investment, and a subsidy. And many people confuse uh, federal subsidies to science as being subsidies rather than investments, and I'll show you why. So if you look over the past 30 years, there's no doubt that, that the statistics will show you we've made progress on several fronts. John knows the uh, remarkable change in cancer death rates, absolute rates that have fallen, even though the population has increased, we're seeing less death uh, from cancer. This is the, now it's the third year in a row. And if you look and you ask yourself, we have conducted a war on cancer since 1971. And I always ask people, say, well, do you know how much that war has cost you, each, each one of us, how much do we spend on cancer research, each single one of us as Americans? Would you say $100 each? Who votes $100? 1,000? 10? It's, it's $9 per year. That's what each one of us has invested over the past 30 years in terms of cancer research. If you look at even more, more remarkable statistics, there's been a 60% drop in mortality for heart disease and stroke. And the investment in heart disease is about $4 per American per year. And if you look at disability rates, they have plunged uh, for seniors since 1982 by about one and a half, two percent a year. So that life expectancy has gone up. And if you look at the total investment per American per year over that period of time, it's about $44 per year. So I really think we should look at these issues as hard-nosed return on investments relative to value as well as relative to costs. And it's hard to do, but it's, it's necessary to do. The second point I'd like to make, besides the impact of NIH, is what's the strategy in terms of policy between the federal investment and the private investment? And I have a very simple uh, graphic to show you. The way I looked at it is that the NIH investment is about $29 billion, should be seen as a pyramid, whereby we invest in the fundamental research which may or may never uh, lead to an application, and then we really make the early investment in translation, and sometimes we have to make late investments like clinical research to find out if something is safe for the public and things that the industry may not want to do. And that ratio is balanced by an inverted pyramid in the private sector. The private sector invests $64 billion a year in biomedical research when you combine pharma with biotech with foundations and so on, and you realize that the investment, basically the two investments are balanced because the federal government supports the fundamental discoveries and you see an inverted pyramid in terms of application in the uh, private sector. And typically, uh, when you look at our investments, about 60% is basic and 40% is applied. Now we try to maintain that ratio, and about 70% of our total budget is what we call investigator-initiated. In other words, it's the balance between top-down versus bottom-up research. This is a policy issue that is discussed around the world. Everywhere you go, people say, should you have smart people in the Ministry of Education or Science and Technology dictating where things should go, or should you really let a thousand flowers bloom? This is a very fundamental policy issue, and we've cut it at 70% bottom up, let the flowers bloom, and 30% things that we believe are very important to do and to promote. So that's where the United States stands. And if you look at the funding, it has really spread uh, around the country to a more even uh, distribution. It's still heterogeneous with the coasts being very strong, but Texas, for example, has made enormous strides in terms of research funding and capacity over the years. More importantly, you see the impact on technology development. Just over the past, between 1998 and 2004, there were 3,114 technologies that came out of the NIH-funded researchers, or NIH itself, that, that were uh, marketed. In other words, it wasn't just applied for patents, but it was marketed. And about 4,500 companies have been formed as a result of federally funded research. Having said that, public health is a very difficult field, and the challenges evolve all the time. It's a moving target. As you make progress, people live longer, new diseases emerge, 
And you need to understand that the landscape that we deal with as a society has changed since the 70s. And let me tell you how I see the priorities. So from one point, we've made progress. From the other point, where are we and where are the challenges from the standpoint of policymaking? And if you look at it, there's one driver that is a major force, and that is the shift from acute to chronic diseases. 80% of our healthcare costs are on chronic diseases, whereas in the 50s, people didn't live as long as they do today in terms of surviving cancer or surviving a heart attack or surviving a stroke. So we knew, do have a very different landscape, which is also driven by demographics with an aging population and driven by health disparities. It is continuously a challenge, both here inside the country as well as throughout the world. And as the world evolves, we know emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are becoming a greater and greater challenge, from flu to SARS to HIV AIDS to many others. And we are seeing also the emergence of what you would call emerging non-communicable diseases, obesity, mental health issues, depression, uh, those are new challenges that didn't exist before that we have to tackle. So the scope of the challenges has shifted and increased as well. So obesity is a good example, a societal example. Is this our genetics? Is this our driven environmental changes? Is this our diet and food industry? Very, very difficult. Education, very difficult to tease out what it is that is underlying this epidemic, which has the potential because of the, the comorbidities that come from obesity has the potential to reverse the public health gains that we've made over the past 50 years. So I asked the question, is this genetics or is this environment? And we did an experiment. So we, we, we asked if we could get an experimental model that had no genes. <laughs> so somebody suggested a statue, because there's no DNA in a statue like Michelangelo's. So how do we test the environment? Well, maybe we'll bring Michelangelo's to a visit in the United States. And it was done, actually. Michelangelo came on a large tour of many museums in the United States for about a year. And this was the result. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it's proof positive that our environment <laughs> certainly is responsible to a great extent. But having said that, um, it's obvious that we have a challenge in front of us, and that is the cost of health care is rising at a pace that is not sustainable. You cannot have a health care increase at 8 9% when the economy is at 1% or 2 or 3%. And if you look at the projections, it's going to double in the next 10 years to $4.3 trillion. It will be the number one economic activity both in the United States and probably in the world. So it's very, very concerning because it completely imbalances our ability to invest in new areas and to sustain development in other areas. And I think the current paradigm that we, are, we have experienced over the past 150 years or 5,000 years to always wait for the patient to get sick for doctors to intervene. And we also know that in chronic diseases, the later you intervene, the more the cost. So that the typical paradigm is to intervene quite late. It's what we call curative treatment. So you come in, you, the cancer is already established, you have a, a heart attack, and, and you need a heart transplant. It's very, very costly. So the whole drive over the past seven, seven, 30 years has been to sort of intervene earlier and earlier in the curve at the time when the disease is not critical but manageable. And so that's what we call symptom management. So we, we try to find correlations like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and we try to correct those symptoms, not necessarily knowing what the fundamental mechanisms are, but we know from epidemiologic studies and, and trials that this work, works. So this is what we call the symptom management phase, where you can actually keep a disease in a manageable range, if you will. Patient is not healthy, but it's, it's not in the critical state. But frankly, the, the real strategy that we would like to follow is to uh, not only move back into the curve, the cost curve, but move back into the health curve. And instead of trying to hope for these cost savings, try to really move earlier at a, what, a stage that we call molecular preemption. In other words, understanding at the molecular level exactly when a disease starts to develop. You don't become diabetic overnight. It starts 25 years before. You don't become 
someone who has a heart disease overnight, it starts 25 years before, how do we try to grasp, grasp those elements of biology very early and to intervene early? This is what has the greatest potential to change the healthcare equation in the country from the scientific standpoint. And this is the goal of our research. So NIH has been changing its strategies to reflect better what we call molecular preemption. This is the ultimate goal. <clears throat> and if you look at real examples, we're already seeing this. Uh, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, um, there was no treatment. And then through advances in immunology, and some of that research actually was done in cancer, we found that tumor necrosis factors, factors that necrose tumors, had a lot to do with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease where the, the immune system turns against our cells. And by treating that, we've basically brought back uh, rheumatoid arthritis from the late stages to the intermediate manageable stages. It has changed the life of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So these new drugs are dramatically slowing disease progression. That's symptom management. But over the past um, uh, few years, we have really tried to intervene and preempt the disease by understanding its mechanistic base. And we have, for example, just in 2006, we found three new genes, and we're really hot, hot on the trail of finding out the trigger for rheumatoid arthritis and intervening properly. So the, the, the future paradigm of healthcare, from the, my standpoint, the, the standpoint of where should we aim, is what we call the four Ps. You have to be more predictive. You also understand that every disease now is a lot more complex than we thought it was. And humans have a tremendous variability in their response to both environment and, and disease. So it needs to be personalized. And hopefully, as we accumulate our knowledge, we'll be able to be preemptive. But this will require a change in the deployment of our healthcare resources, because people will not be sick at the time we intervene. They need to participate in their care. And our society has to change how it organizes its view of health. So instead of having healthcare management organizations, we may see the emergence of what we call healthy living organizations. And uh, we had a little experiment with the head of CDC, Julie Gerberding. I said, why don't we publish publicly, district by district by district, the fundamental health statistics, obesity rates, heart disease rates, diabetes rates. You could not imagine the impact that had on politicians. They called us. I got phone calls. What do you mean I'm the worst district in the United States? Well, yes, you're the fattest, ugliest. You know. <laughs> that, that made a huge difference in behavior. What can I do about changing that? As long as it doesn't percolate in the reality of our political and societal life, I don't think we'll be able to, to move the, the needle towards a better, healthier uh, nation. Having said that, let me now tell you a little bit about where the, the limiting factors are, and that is our ability to translate our emerging knowledge into real benefits, drugs and so on, is not doing well. If you look at FDA, FDA is approving lesser and lesser numbers of new molecular entities. Uh, biologicals are not being approved at the same rate, and it's not the FDA. It's really the fact that we do not have a good scientific understanding of safety and efficacy at the biological level. Everybody blames the FDA, their great colleagues, they're being scapegoated. Please, the FDA needs help. It doesn't need criticism. It's a, it is a hard job because the science underneath of it is not complete. So my view is that we need to accelerate, not slow down, our understanding of biology. And the, the, the limit to me is the fact that Biological systems are much more complex than we thought they were. In 1971, when President Nixon launched the war on cancer, there was this notion that we would discover magic bullets, that one drug, well thought out, will destroy all cancers. Well, cancer is 20, 220 diseases, and of those, many of them have subtypes. So you're talking about a thousand different entities at least. How do we grapple with this complexity? How do we understand these biological systems that, we, that sustain us in health and disease? That's really the issue. That's where the science is. And we do not have the tools at this point to truly understand that as well as we should. So I think NIH really has to make investments in, in a strategic sense. 
And the best example I can give you of what's the analogy, think of what you see on the left side here, which is our current understanding of how a cell responds to damage. Many, many molecules are really interacting. We know we have about 24,000 genes, but those genes code a million different proteins. So we know that the code of DNA needs to be understood in terms of what it encodes and how these proteins interact, how much they interact. And that, inter that sort of dynamic picture is what's lacking. We know the elements. We don't really know how all of it is imbricated, integrated, syn synchronized. It's a little bit as if you came from outer space and you landed on Earth and you found a, an electronic Intel chip, the Intel Inside chip, and you didn't know how, what it was about because you never developed it. You try to figure out how it worked. And for 50 years you search and you find transistors and capacitors and all the elements which we did in molecular biology. We found DNA and RNA and proteins and so on. But then if you ask the question, what was that chip for? You really would have to have the PC that has WordPerfect on it and PowerPoint to be able to study how that chip was making the thing sing. That's where we are. We have the elements. We don't really understand how the software works. And that's truly the fundamental limit and where we are in, in terms of uh, the, the leading edge of science, understanding how DNA functions, understanding how that affects the proteins that are encoded. So here I put a cartoon together um, that basically explains where, a little bit what the problem is. So we know we have DNA, and DNA encodes certain proteins, A, B, C, D, E, and we know that all of this is interacting. So, for example, C might be repressing the production of A. Uh, this is what we mean when we have a stop sign like that. Or it might encourage the production of D. So one of the advances over the past 15 years has been, hmm, if we could discover what the genome code was, and that was the basis of the Human Genome Project, and then we could find if there are errors in that code, perhaps that will tell us how things work. This is what we call the genomic approach to understanding biology. So for example, the idea here is if you search the genome in a disease population, and then you compared it to the healthy population, and you saw a difference. For example, you'd find that in C here in this protein, there was a misspelling, which really created a change in the protein. The protein became dysfunctional, misshapen. And we know that in life, everything is contact. Information is transferred by contact. And if that happened, then what would happen? Well, obviously C could no longer repress the production of A. And C, by the way, could not increase the production of D that would repress E. So what would happen? You get more A and more E. Your cholesterol goes up, for example, or your triglycerides go up. There are things that we observe as doctors here in the proteins, this is what we call proteomics, that tell us that something is wrong. Your sugar goes up or your insulin goes down. But frankly, we need to explore this, and this is where we are in terms of our biological research. For example, in the past three years, we've made more discoveries than we've made in the past 50 years in terms of understanding where those genetic abnormalities are. We understand, we have uh, clues, but let me show you how fast it's going. This is a map of all the human chromosomes. And these chromosomes, you can basically mark abnormalities or misspellings on the genome. And in 2005, there was one that was known which related to macular degeneration of, age, of old age. And um, age related. And then in 2006, we made three discoveries. And I was very happy to go back to Congress and tell them that we became three times as productive than the year before. And then in the first quarter of 2007, we made six more. And then the second quarter, 20. And then the third quarter, another 20. And then the th fourth quarter, another 20. And then in 2008, there was an explosion. I can tell you, I couldn't keep up with the number of discoveries that people were making in schizophrenia, in autism, in cancer, in diabetes. Everywhere, the genomic revolution has really given us clues that we never had before. So these clues are going to lead all of us now to try to understand that network that I was describing. That's where science is today. 
we are maybe 10% of the way there. We need to sustain our effort to understand the other 90% because if we don't understand it, we won't affect the science. So in a, in a nutshell, Scientific evolution is at the point where the data is exploding. The, we, we, we have an enormous amount of new data. We're trying to understand it, but understand it in terms of its logic, uh, regulation, its software uh, function. And as uh, John mentioned, I try to do this through a process at the NIH called the roadmap that says, mm, if the world is changing so fast in science, wouldn't you want to have organizational structures and agencies and institutes and centers and universities that change just as fast? You can't really adapt to a fast-changing world by being static. So we created what we call a venture space. We took a little percentage of the NIH budget and we said, let's talk about what really needs to happen. And we came up with these three concepts. One was you needed to really explore completely different pathways to discovery. You can't understand the software of life the same way you try to understand the hardware. It's like a car. You can't just take the car apart and say you understand it. You really have to make it uh, to study it differently, which also meant that you needed different teams of research. And research teams of the future are going to be very different. They're already very different than what they were. So we need to facilitate that. And in my view, uh, modern science requires a diversity of strategies and people coming from all walks of science. So the disciplines that we've had in the past that were very rigid, you know, chemistry is chemistry, biochemistry is biochemistry, and biophysics, those, those barriers need to melt. But they need to melt not at the president's level or the CEO level or whatever. They need to melt between scientists. The scientists should be able to free associate and self-assemble, whether it be on the campus of Rice University or MD Anderson or across the world. And this flexibility is what's going to be needed. Because to explore a new world like this, you need not only pioneers, but you need settlers, and you need all kinds of, of, uh, of approaches and people. And that's what we mean by research teams of the future, because the scale and complexity of today's biomedical research demand that scientists move between the confines of their individual disciplines, and you have to explore new organizational models. So how you make it happen is the key challenge for science policy makers. How do you prevent silos and encourage cross-fertilization between sciences, whether it be biological sciences, physical sciences, computer sciences? Uh, in my field, in imaging sciences, we benefited mostly from astronomy. I mean, people don't appreciate that I was in CAT scanning, and all of the algorithms I used in CAT scanning when I developed my patents and early research actually came from astronomy, astronomical research. Uh, it was very interesting to see how one field uh, seeds another one. And last but not least, the greatest risk in science is to stop taking risk, especially when the economy is not good and people really see this as the wrong time to take a risk. And I think that there is never a wrong time to do the right thing. And that's the key here. You have to encourage risk taking. And, and we have tried to do this by giving young investigators or any investigator mm, dollars in the, in the worst of times to try new ideas. So that's what we call our high risk, high impact program. Congress supported it and in the NIH Reform Act actually enshrined this in the ability of the, F the NIH to have a small percentage of its money uh, dedicated to what we call unique opportunities or emerging opportunities. And we've committed a billion dollars to do that. I'll give you just one example because you can't understand how important that is unless you hear examples of specific scientists doing specific things. This uh, young scientist, Carl Deseroth, is from Stanford. He applied to the NIH regular process three times and was turned down. He had an idea that was really crazy. He came up with the concept that he could take what we call an ion channel. This, these are channels in cells that transport ions, sodium or chloride. And he knew that these channels were very important in neurons. The way our neurons work is by having ions move in and out of cells. And he found out from a German scientist that there was an ion channel in an algae in a lake in Germany that had the ability to open up or close uh, when the light changed. 
and it was a chloride channel. Now we know that chloride stops neurons from firing. And he said, well, I'm going to take that from an algae and I'm going to put it in a human or a mammalian cell, a mouse cell, and uh, maybe I could stop the neuron from functioning. Then he heard about a jellyfish that had another uh, channel that was a sodium channel, but that one was for blue light. The first one was yellow light, the second one was blue light. And these are things that have been developed over time by evolution where if the light was shining, the algae will bloom. If the light was not, they wouldn't, and jellyfish would come up when there was light and down. And, and he said, look, I'm going to take genetic engineering. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put these two channels in a neuron. And he said, I'll try with the worm um, because that's easy to do, and then I'll try the mouse. And everybody said, you're completely out of your mind until he came to this high-risk, high-impact program called the Pioneer Awards, made a presentation, and then we asked the, the jury, do you find any reason why it's completely impossible for that to happen? And everybody said, no, it could. Well, if it could, let's try it. We tried it. This gentleman, 34 years old, discovered probably the most significant new tool to understand the complexity of the brain. He sent me a video a little DVD to my office after a few months. And the DVD had a little worm, experimental worms called C. elegans. And the, the worm was going from left to right on the screen, and he was showing yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue flashes of light. And then he reversed it to blue, yellow, blue, yellow, and the, the worm came back. And then yellow, blue, and the worm came back forward. It was the most incredible pleasure, you know, feeling of of great pleasure that you have as an agency director to see that taking risk is actually the greatest pathway to reward. But taking risk with young investigators with new ideas is something we should never move away from. It's the strength of our system and it shouldn't be top down. It should be really come from these young investigators. And I'd like to basically show you two points in terms of policy. A long term point, which is the aging of the scientific workforce in the United States and what we need to do about it. When I looked at this issue, I couldn't believe the data. I'm, you know, John knows I'm very data-driven, so I asked our folks at the NIH to, to go back to 1980 and tell me how were the scientists in 1980 and, and how uh, we've evolved since 1980. So let me show you a little movie here. This is the distribution in red of the age curve. So at the bottom you have the age of scientists and the percent of how many of them we, we had. The red is medical school faculty. And the blue bars are the scientists that NIH was funding at that time. This is 1980. And if you look at it, you can see that you typically started to become a faculty member at age 33, 34 maybe. And it didn't take you long to get a grant because by the time you get appointed, it takes about a year to get an NIH grant. Look at the evolution of that over time. So this is 1984, 85, 86. So we're aging, we're moving to the right, obviously. Keep going, it gets worse. 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and here we are. And here's what happened. Obviously, look at where we were and look where we are now. 41, 42, when we get people appointed now at 37, 38, 39. And look at the distance it takes for a young investigator to get funded. See that? It used to be a year, now it's three, four years. Not good. I actually give the example of David Baltimore or Marshall Nirenberg, two Nobel laureates. They did their research when they were 27, 28, 29, 30 years old. Uh, David Baltimore received his Nobel Prize at age 35. And uh, Marshall Nuremberg was about the same age. And my punchline is, in those days, you could get a Nobel Prize uh, after you got your NIH grant. Today, you would have to get your Nobel Prize before you get your first NIH grant. <laughs> that is not, not sustainable. Now, you look at this and you say, why is that? I mean, yes, there are, there's the baby boom generation and so on. And I really wanted to look at it forward uh, once the baby boom generation retires, because we know that people are going to retire. So this may be an artifact. And established investigators always give you the thousand reasons why 
they are the ones deserving and not the new generation. They're not that smart. They're not, they're not experienced. And, and I said, well, let's look forward and looking at actuarial tables of how people retire, where, we, where would we be if we didn't change policy as a country? Where would we be in 2020? So look at the data. This is 2007. Same thing. This was the initial distribution. 2011, 14, 15. And this was modeled with two separate teams that looked at the modeling and really kicked the tires of this model. Uh, and if we didn't change policy, this would be the picture in 2020. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you look here at age 70 and you look at the number of folks that we fund above age 70, nothing against age 70, uh, please don't misunderstand. Now I have a right of free speech, so I can, I can speak straight. But look at that part of the curve and look at 40 and below. And you'll realize that we will have as many scientists funded by NIH that are 70 and older than we do scientists 40 and younger. If you let it evolve as we are letting it evolve today, I think from my standpoint as a policy maker at NIH, as unpopular as it is, I couldn't resist to say this to me is the, probably the greatest long-term policy issue that will threaten the United States' competitiveness. If in 2020 I have more scientists that are at the end of their life, uh, scientific life, than I have at the beginning, that means I'm losing. I'm losing the new generation. So we have to do something. I tried. And the reason why this, ha this is happening is, in my view, the sort of bias, the natural bias that we have as a society of favoring what's established and proven and has a track record and great papers and Academy of Sciences appointments and so on over that 34-year-old who comes up with combining algae and jellyfish and, and mammalian cells. That's why. And if you look at it historically, these are the success rate that you see between established and new investigators. And over the years, it's always been a 5 or 6% differential. Every, except in the 80s. In the 80s, there was no competition. Young investigators got, got, had received quite a bit of success. Nowadays, the success rate of a young investigator is half what it was in 1980. And in 6% difference, if you add that over the years, obviously the cohort that is more established will grow at a compound rate, and the cohort that is not established will decrease at a compound rate. That's what we need to change. And we did so in 2005 and 2006. I established new policies because if you looked at the number of new investigators here in 1985, we had 1,800. At the peak of the doubling, the system only allowed 1,683. Tells you there's a bias. And then as soon as the doubling ended, which is this curve here, this is my, uh, when I tell people I'm a transformative leader, is I mean that I came during the doubling and I transformed into the undoubling. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, when you look at this, you see the drop. The young investigators got it through the nose. So we established a new policy right here that said, no, we will have a floor based on these projections of about 1,600 new, science, new investigators. And it has worked. Uh, I have to tell you, peer review panels, uh, institute directors support the idea because they see the data. And we know that if we don't, we won't be able to explore that 90 percent of exploration space that is not there. And so it's, it's doing OK. The age curve is flat. It's not improving. But that is a, one issue that is in the long term. The second policy issue I want to talk to you about and finish my talk with is this one. The US scientific infrastructure is at risk. And that's an immediate problem. And the reason it is an immediate problem is because of the economic crisis that has made it even more immediate than it was before. You know that the NIH budget has not kept up with inflation. It didn't get cut, but it didn't keep up with inflation. More importantly, the, science, the physical sciences budgets have not kept up with either inflation or the need. So as a nation, we're falling behind when other nations are tripling their investments in science. Now, the economic crisis is doing something which I have studied since the summer, and I was really alarmed, and I want to share my alarm with you. If you ask university presidents, 
our president here is here. Uh, you look at the endowment values, they've dropped by 20 to 30 percent. And that's a very important source of revenue to sustain research and sustain faculty. Gift giving has dropped this year because of the economic situation. Tuition rates are maximized. You can't really get revenues. For those who have healthcare centers, clinical revenues are net, clinical revenues are decreasing. Why? Because you have more uninsured who come in, uncompensated care, so you have to cover for that. So that makes these very at-risk institutions. They tend to be uh, the number one uh, employer in their area. And yet, there is not a word, uh, not a word, in the economic stimulus package for science. I find that to be an immediate alarming trend, that we are worried about protecting the industries of the past at the expenses of the industries of the future, which can only come through progress in science and technology. And I think that should be something that all of our community needs to say, needs to say loudly, and needs to say before January 20th. Because it is, in my view, the most important issue, because we are going to lose the infrastructure that we have. And universities have borrowed a lot of money to de deploy this capacity. We're in a good position today. We may lose it. And my, my message to you is think about the economic implications of having the number one employers in many, many communities already cutting and already letting people go. Harvard, with its largest endowment, has already done that. So it's, not a, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter that is occurring during the holidays, Christmas, and by the time it plays out, the scientific community would have had no voice in making sure that the economic impact uh, on our scientific infrastructure is understood by everyone. Last but not least, I want to tell you about the core vision. So in summary, I think we want to transform medicine and, and health from a curative to a preemptive paradigm. That's point one. Second, we want to accelerate fundamental research in the software of life, understanding the complex biological systems that we have. You need to promote the translation of these findings. Can't stop the investment now because we have the need to translate. We need to have more interdisciplinary research, and that means removing artificial barriers, and then we need to stimulate high risk, high impact. And last but not least, we need to be aware that our society has a very schizophrenic view of science. So from the same standpoint of education, I feel that science education is falling behind, and we need to do something about that. The fact is that if you look at statistics and understanding of science in our population, 65% of our people do not believe in evolution, I'm told. And this issue of creating culture wars between science versus other is, is really something that is detrimental to both science and society. And we need to address it. I've been facing, as John said and as Neil said, many um, different tensions here, especially when it comes to stem cell research, very pro and against, creationism versus evolution. And I, I do have a, quite a reserve of humor, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm concerned because these things can really uh, affect us. I use humor to diffuse that. I don't know how long humor would work in diffusing this, but the best uh, I do when I'm faced with questions about why don't you teach creationism the same way you teach evolution, vice versa, I say, well, look, there was a, there was a, a young, young girl who went to her mother and asked her, Mom, where do we come from? And the mom said, we come from God and Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, and that's how humans were created. That's where we come from. And then she went to her dad, and she said, Dad, where do we come from? And he said, well, you know, five million years ago, apes evolved and monkeys became more intelligent. And a hundred years, a thousand years ago, it came out of Africa, and they came out from the trees, and eventually they become what we are. So our ancestors are the apes. And so she went back to her mom and said, Mom, I'm confused. What is this? Is this God or is this the apes? And she said, look, honey, he was talking about his family. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so with that, I'd like to really thank you uh, for having in, invited me and, uh, and allow me to share with you my uh, 
my uncensored thoughts about where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think uh, it's clear from Dr. Zahuni's presentation why we in the science community were so excited when President Bush announced his appointment six years ago about and what an outstanding job uh, Dr. Zahuni has really done under the words I generally use is extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And while you commented on working for government, giving up your First Amendment rights, I, I do want to say that at critical points you spoke out on important issues and you were able to do it in such a way that you, you were respectful uh, of your position and your responsibility running an agency in the executive branch of government, working for a president, uh, but you maintained your integrity as a scientist and as, as just a key leader in science policy. So I wanted to express my personal appreciation. And then my job really is to, is to read some questions and I will not fiddle these, okay? These, these are as arrived. So first question, what advice do you have for the next NIH director to make science funding and research a higher priority? Well, first of all, I think, I think the next NIH director needs to, in my view, develop a, 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 a message about the importance of sustaining, at least sustaining, and then increasing uh, funding for the NIH. And, what I think happened in the past was NIH directors tend to say, of course we deserve, aren't we treating disease? Are we? But the problem is that as healthcare costs increase, as more and more information is needed to maximize the best use of healthcare resources, this story is, is getting old. And I think the new NIH director has to develop a vision that is what I call object-oriented. In other words, you have to be very specific about what I say, for example, about new investigators, develop the tools and the data to convince policymakers that we need to really address this issue of education, science education, and the development of the next generation of scientists. Same thing is true in terms of how do you invest in terms of making sure that we do move towards preemption. That's my personal vision. So it has to be a vision-driven director, not a process-driven director. Second question. Uh, is, uh, is NIH funding women PIs better than in the past, and could that have some influence on the relationship between age and funding? It's better than the past. Well, typically what you see in biological sciences is a lot less differential between uh, men and women scientists uh, at the entry level, 50, 50 percent. If you go around, around uh, graduate studies, postgraduate studies, and so on, it's about 50 percent. Where you do see a difference, you lose women in mid-career, between the ages of 30 and 40, you lose them. And we don't have good strategies to get them back or give them flexible appointments so that they can take care of that. So right now, the, the, the ratio is about 20, uh, 70, 68 to 32 percent. That's not good enough, but it's improving but it's going to require societal changes again. Uh, for example, if you look at scientists in Europe in biological fields like Sweden or you do a comparative analysis, it's all related to childcare. If you really look at the systems in France and Sweden, uh, it's not related to funding. It's related to the, the contextual support that you need if you're a women scientist, and that's not there. But we're seeing also more leaders appearing in science. I've appointed six uh, women director at the NIH during my tenure, and you see more and more of that new generation coming up. It's a problem. It needs to be worked on. But it's not a, just an issue of funding. It's really an issue of culture and work environment. Can you comment on why the concept of open access is so important to future medical research? Right. So open access, for those of you who don't know, is the concept that if there is a uh, federally funded research, it should be publicly accessible. The precursor to that was the human genome. As you know, uh, at, at the beginning, when the human genome uh, was uh, sequenced, some people thought that we should keep it as confidential. And even high policymakers felt that we should patent every sequence. It's like patenting the dictionary and, and going out and say, oh, I found this keyword, because at the time, 
Everybody thought that once you had the code, the genetic code, you could understand every disease. They forgot that software is not exactly like that. Uh, but they wanted to patent and protect and hide. So worldwide, what was happening is anybody who was doing any sequencing was hiding it. And really, thanks to Jim Watson and, and you, uh, I think, uh, Neil, you played a role there, um, um, the, the, the concept that this is common property of humanity, that these knowledge databases are really the common property of all humans. Uh, then open access to the genome data was the first precursor in science of the, what we call the theory of the commons, that there are things that are not to be um, propri you know, um, uh, uh, propri um, to create propriety or uh, property rights on. That's what I mean. And, and then that got by extension into the concept of other results of fu federally funded research. So for example, data on molecular structures. So we went to the molecular structure co community and tried to have databases to do this. And at the end, somebody said, well, what about publications? Isn't that what we do? And with the internet and the increased need of patients and teachers and students to have access to scientific information, what we realized is there was a huge block. They had to go and pay for each paper and each publication, when in fact 99.9% .9 of that cost was borne by the taxpayer. So open access is really the concept, an extension of the concept that says common, common property should be commonly shared, and if it is generated by public dollars, it should be publicly accessible. The key there, uh, Neil, is that with the development of the internet, we have now seen development of tools that allow you to search, like Google, for example, and there are new tools which will accelerate the progress of science. So scientists may not have to duplicate something that was done already and could find out much more quickly about the progress in any one field, and this would serve patients as well. So that's the idea, is that in the 21st century, this notion of science as a proprietary field that is patented at all costs, any time, all the time, is really differentiating itself into what you would call a commons, and then really when you bring something of great value, well, that you should own. But that's really the policy aspect of it. What are your thoughts on increasing uh, the trust of uh, medical research in the black and brown communities, given the potential to reduce health disparities, especially in chronic uh, conditions? thus improving overall U.S. health? Yeah. You know, uh, this is a really good question. And I looked at it because I had the same view. You know, I, I, I was at Hopkins in Baltimore. Baltimore is a city that has really disparities. And around Hopkins, if, for those of you who know, it's probably the, the, one of the poorest communities uh, in the United States, mostly African-American. And I think there's a pair equation here that's, that's sort of pair equating African-American with with, uh, with uh, health disparities, and, and when you look at it, really the issue is access, socioeconomic fairness, justice, and those issues are not necessarily related to research, because uh, we had uh, some scientists at the NIH do research, uh, Zeke Emanuel actually, and Renner Kington who was the deputy for NIH, did a, a, a really interesting study. They went and they asked people, would you participate in the research project that the NIH does uh, if, you were, if, you, if you wanted to. You know what they found? Minority population, Hispanic and, and African American, had a higher rate of response saying, yes, I would like to, as more, more established white uh, majority populations had better economic status. Why? Because they give them access. If you participate in a research project, you finally get access to health care. So I think it's a lot more than just uh, you know, a, um, a, um, a, a racial disparity issue, it's a fundamental issue with the access uh, and fairness and distribution of healthcare uh, resources. That's what's going to need to happen uh, for health disparities to be corrected. People do want, do want to participate, do want access, it works. We've done it in hypertension, for example, and you really do research in the community and you realize that it's just as effective in translating those uh, findings. Um, so I think there is a, uh, there's quite a bit of research to, to be done there. So we've got time for one more question, so let me summarize all four of these. Uh, are you, you have concerns about our system of K-12 education 
and the implications for the future of medical research in general, uh, how would you want to encourage young people in this country to get into scientific research? Uh, what would you advise to students at any level, including PhDs, with regard to their careers? So th this is, a, again, probably a defining question for the future. You only have a minute. Huh? <laughs> what? You only have one minute. Yeah. So, and within the minute left, I think it's important to realize that that our educational system has created incentives and, and misincentives really relative to science education. We also really, uh, um, if, you, if you ask questions, and we have research that shows that um, in schools, uh, science activities are no longer recognized as meritorious. We, we had all the science winners for the, uh, the Intel Westinghouse come to the NIH, we interviewed them, there was a social science study that was done. The number one driver is that society doesn't seem to recognize or value the achievements of 12-year-old, uh, 13-year-old in science. They recognize sports, they recognize. So the, when, when you hear these kids, they tell you, I don't have the opportunity, and when I do something in science, it's not recognized. The third is our teachers are not trained uh, in a way that, that promotes good education in science. I, I think this issue of K-12 education is um, probably something that the next president and anybody who's in charge of education really needs to tackle. It's a societal issue more than it is a, just a funding issue. Well, one more minute. Advice to new PhDs coming out or just finishing I think their degree? Uh, I think, you know, it's going to be a great time uh, because if you look at, you know, I was giving the aging population, that's for P, that's for uh, funded uh, investigators if nothing changes. But clearly what's happening is uh, all the, the, the data shows that there's there going to be a deficit of 17 million positions in the United States, many of, of those in science. So uh, I can't imagine that with the opportunities that are coming from all the retirements beyond you know, NIH-funded research industry and all of the other fields of, of the country that require PhD level education, that this is not going to be a valuable, a continuously valuable career path. Thank you. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Zahim. Thank you.